Be the Talk, episode 225, featuring Larry Jacobson. Welcome to Be the Talk. We go behind the talk seven days a week for tips and techniques to help you change the world. I'm Nathan Eckel, and a talker myself, I'm interviewing others who change the world with their talk. You can too, even if you've never given a talk before. Let's get started with today's show. We are live with Larry Jacobson. Larry, are you ready to talk? Definitely ready. A California native, circumnavigator, and adventurer, Larry Jacobson is a recognized entrepreneur and leadership expert. An avid sailor, Larry has over 50,000 blue water miles to his name. Author of the award-winning bestseller, The Boy Behind the Gate, and the new book, Navigating Entrepreneurship, Larry is a motivational speaker and entrepreneur coach. Larry Jacobson, welcome to the talk. It's great to be here. Thanks, Nathan. So you've given multiple branded talks. Your latest is Passion Trumps Fear. And uh, you mentioned in the talk that one of the scariest, riskiest things in life, you, you ask us that question, what are the scariest and riskiest things? And you mentioned how you've been chased by dragons, chased by pirates, stuck in the storm, in the Red Sea, and a whole host of other adventures. Please take us behind the talk, Larry. Yeah. Well, uh, a lot of people are asking me, you know, how can you possibly have gone on this trip? You, know, you left everything behind and you ended up with all of these incredible adventures and they were all really scary. Weren't they, Larry? Like, I mean, Larry, are you just fearless? How do you do this? And um, so I started putting my answers together to people and saying, no, I'm not fearless. I have a lot of fears. Um, especially snakes. <laughs> and, well, just like um, Indiana Jones had, was scared of snakes, if I exactly remember correctly. Right. That is very right. Yeah. And someone actually thought that they said, oh, you're just like Indiana Jones. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, that's who I can aspire to be. But uh, no, I, I had a lot of fear um, on this trip. And it was. There, we were in incredible storms in the Red Sea with 30-foot seas and winds up to 60 knots for 24 hours and just really points where I thought, well, this is it. This is it. It's over now. Um, uh, I was tangled up in a line underwater and scuba diving once. Uh, we were chased by Komodo dragons in Indonesia. We were we dodged pirates for three days in the Gulf of Aden uh, in Pirate Alley. And um, these were all really scary events. Well, how did I do that? People kept saying, how did you how did you face your fears? You must have conquered your fears. Well, a lot of people have uh, different ways of looking at fear. And I'm like, no, I didn't conquer them. I was scared to death during this whole time. I mean, uh, in, in fact, I say that I was scared pretty much almost every day for six years. And I was like, well, OK, so how'd you do it? And I, I kind of reverse engineered it. And I figured out how I get through my fears. And that's where I came up with my two-step system about how to manage your fears. Powerful stuff. Um, do you miss sailing? You were, you were sailing around the world for six years. It was your lifelong dream. Do you feel like Frodo coming back to the Shire after all of that? Uh, or or are, you, are you able to reflect or have you found new challenges? People, it's a good, really good question. And people have asked me that many times is that, you know, now what? Um, would you do it again? And the answer is to that question is, well, sure, I would do it if I hadn't done it. But now that I've done it, I've pretty much satisfied my sailing itch, I think. And you're in six years in the tropics. And now I'm in San Francisco Bay where it's cold and foggy and, and too windy and there's ships traffic. And it's, uh, I, I think that I got a good, uh, scratched my itch really well for sailing. What was your um, most salient moment? I mean, you've had thousands of them. You had the mundane, and then you had the the you know the the not mundane, the the terrifying. What was the most poignant moment for you, just in this moment that you're thinking of right now, Larry? Yeah, um, the one that really comes to mind is when we were just we were leaving Thailand, headed across the to head across the Indian Ocean. And just those, just the words, the exotic places that we were. And I was sitting on the foredeck and the boat is sailing along nicely under autopilot. And I'm sitting there just going, okay, now 
what are you doing? Oh, yeah, you're on the foredeck of your own boat that you're captain of, and you're sailing from Thailand across the Indian Ocean towards the Red Sea. Wake up, Larry, and <laughs> smell the coffee and smell the roses. And I came up with this term where I marked the moment. Mm. I marked the worth of every day. Mm. And that's when that started. So the lesson learned for, for all of us talk universe is to stay present. Larry's sailing literally in the most exotic seas on the planet, and he's still having to remind himself to stay present and relish the moment and appreciate it. Was that, did That's you conquer, exactly right. did you conquer that? Or were there other times beyond that where you said, Hey, mark the moment? I, I, yeah, there, I, I said that all the time. I said, mark the moment because what happens is you get so busy in the moment doing something mm. like, for example, you're in the middle of a storm and you are just focused. Mm. You are sharp mm. and you're focused and you're alert and you're handling the boat because it's all about keeping that boat afloat. <laughs> and that's what you're doing. And then it's over and you go, whew, boy, glad that's over. But really, were you really glad? Because mm. there you were in the Red Sea having this incredible experience, but you almost don't get to see it. You almost don't get to see it happen. Hmm. So I did remind hmm. myself of that a lot. Good question. Did you ever capsize? Did you have no. uh, close calls or, or we you know, pirates uh, or, or a close call? I mean, <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of close of calls of, of, of things. Um, but as far as things like capsizing, no, we had a, a it was a 50 foot boat, 25 tons, our keel was seven and a half tons, so we weren't probably going to capsize. We came uh, close, I would say fairly close to a knockdown, mm. um, which is where the mass touches the water. We didn't get there, but only about, say, uh, maybe two-thirds of the way there. Um, that was when we were we in the Red Sea. We were flying off the top of 30-foot waves, oh. and as the boat drops down about 20 feet and then – as it's dropping down, it fall, tends to fall over. And um, those were close moments. Um, there were close moments also uh, for myself where I had a personal um, accident. Mm. I thought that I was really, that was it. Mm. I was tangled up in a rope oh. underneath the water oh. about 30, about 40 feet down. Um, you mentioned scuba diving, or scuba is this diving. a different? Is this a different? Uh, event? No, this, this is, is the same. That. This was scuba diving, <laughs> and I made that one mistake, which is if you're anybody who's a scuba diver knows the number one rule, which is never dive alone. And I broke it, mm. and I nearly paid the price for it. Well, never again. Talk never. universe. Never, never dive alone. Mark never the dive moment. Alone. <laughs> how, how often? Never. Never. How really? Ever. 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 <laughs> Larry, have you ever seen anything close to a rogue wave? Uh, I've never seen anything like um, when they talk about rogue waves, they talk about 50 and 60 foot uh, waves. The uh, biggest seas that we experienced were, say, 30, 35 feet, which are already Just, huge, yeah. but they were consistently 30 feet. Mm. Um, and rogue waves tend to come from a far distance away. So, for example, we were, we were crossing the Atlantic Ocean. The seas were, in general, about 20 feet behind us, and we were just surf our boat down 20-foot seas at 10, 12 knots. It was just an amazing, exhilarating experience. Uh, every once in a while, we would see a sea that would be coming. We'd go, holy cow! Okay, it's not what, really what we said, but... <laughs> I'm trying to keep it radio friendly. Yeah. Uh, keep it we PG. Oh, my God. Look at that. And it would might be 30 feet or, in other words, 50 percent bigger than the regular waves. But and that sea would have come from a thousand miles away. So, um, you know, we saw them, but nothing that was really going to just uh, be trouble for us. Powerful stuff. Yeah. Powerful yeah. stuff. Is is there any difference between this is where my ignorance is showing a, a little bit. Any difference between that, a, a rogue wave uh, versus like a, um, th there was, there was the tsunami wave. I guess that's when it's almost like a, like a plateau of water as opposed to a physical wave. Yeah. A wave ca is caused by, usually by weather. Okay. Um, uh, and, and, you know, by a storm or something. Um, like when we were crossing the Atlantic, we were halfway across the Atlantic. We were still feeling, uh, seas that were being generated up near the UK. Mm -hmm. 
So mm-hmm. a thousand, you know, a thousand, fifteen hundred miles away. The tsunami is only a one event, mm-hmm. a one wave event or two. Uh, sometimes they come in pairs and it's caused by earth movement, earthquakes. We were, um, we just missed the tsunami barely by the skin of our teeth. Mm. Uh, when we were in Thailand. And, um, oh, wow. The, the tsunami. The tsunami. So this yeah. is the 2004 we in, tsunami. Yeah. Wow. The tsunami. You missed yeah. that tsunami. I can tell you real briefly how we missed it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So we were, um, uh, we were anchored at Patong Bay, which is this absolutely beautiful, stunningly beautiful bay. It's about two miles long, white sand beaches, water crystal clear turquoise. And we were anchored the, about 100 yards offshore. When we wanted a cold beer, we'd swim ashore and buy one. It was just that great of a place. It was perfectly calm. There were other boats anchored there. There were fishing boats. And we decided that we were going to be there uh, for the Christmas party. They had a big, they have a big Christmas party every year at this beach. So that was our plan just to be there. And this was like in November. And about a couple of weeks before that, uh, my partner, Ken said, Hey, you know what? I think I want to go home. Let's go. Uh, can we go back home? I want to see my family for Christmas. And we changed our plans to haul the boat out and have work done in a boat yard up a river while we flew home yeah. for uh, to see his parents, to see family for the holidays. Had we stayed, <laughs> mm. that Patong Beach where we were anchored, the tsunami hit that beach mm. square on, mm. killed 5,500 people right on that beach, the beach and wiped alone. out every yeah. boat in the anchorage. And there, w- there was... It, it was well over a hundred thousand people perished. Over two hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah, it, it was all, absolutely all huge. So, yeah. was your boat also ruined in in that, or or no. was it off on our shore? Bo- our boat was sitting up on the hard, so it was in a in wow. a yard, in a cradle, oh. and it was up a river and then up oh. another place. And but still, the water rose so much that uh, the water uh, was lapping at the bottom of the cradle. Wow. Of, of, of the boat. So and and it was that experience. far inland. Yeah. And it still it got amazing. touched and almost removed from the cradle. Uh, yeah. I've got and to then, ask. Go on. Well, uh, I mean, the only, I would say the only part of it that was maybe ruined is after the tsunami, about 12 people moved on board oh. uh, to live on, to yeah. needed a place to live. Yeah. And we were still back here. It's a and humanitarian. We like, well, okay, uh, yeah. So did we you, raised a whole bunch of money when we were back here to bring okay. back to them. And we brought the, everybody who had been working on our boat. There were 12 of them. We brought them back the cash equivalent of at least three months wages for mm. each one of them. Wow. And so they got the money directly because uh, yeah. they weren't getting it through the agencies. How long did it take for you to just logistically get back to a uh, just a completely wiped out area after something like that? Logistically, we could have gone back within about two weeks. But Mm. mentally, we couldn't. Oh, mentally, we were Mm. just frozen. Mm. We were, we were. uh, Do we go? Do we stay? Uh, You know, there is there disease? Is there? You know, all the newspaper things that you read in here. And we finally went back after about a month. Wow! And we and we were devastated. Yeah, I mean, just I mean, we we lost friends and we we lost people. uh, people who we knew who mm. lost their husbands and their wives and their cousins and everybody lost somebody. Yeah. It's terrible, but it was, and that was actually one of the hardest points to move on from mm-hmm. because you're yeah. realizing, Oh, kind of what's the point of everything. I mean, every, you know, if you can just be wiped out so quickly, but then you take the other side, which is that is the point of doing things because mm-hmm. you could be wiped out so quickly. We've been enjoying this conversation with Larry Jacobson. His talk is called Passion Trumps Fear. And we're talking about fear and its riveting. This is this why we, we're taking a little bit more time today, because these fear stories are pretty amazing. It's a reason why we watch The Hobbit. It's filled with overcoming fears. It's a reason why we're talking to Larry so much. But we will be right back in just a moment with Larry Jacobson with the Blitz Round. People ask, how could I start a a seven-day-a-week podcast? 
It's because of what I've learned from my mentors. Some of the best mentors in history aren't around anymore. They've left hours of one-on-one mentoring behind in their books. Each month at Classics on Tap, I record a new chapter from a classic business book to help you make a difference. Download your first chapter at ClassicsOnTap.com. And we're back with Larry Jacobson. It is time for the Blitz Round. We're finally pivoting over to you, Talk Universe. We're going to talk about uh, a series of either-or questions related to the preparation and performance of his recent talk, Passion Trumps Fear. Larry, are you ready? I'm ready. Now, Larry, you've given several talks, so uh, feel free to comment out of that experience. Uh, first question, were you invited to speak or did you apply? Um, I was. I applied, actually, for the first one. Um, as I think one of your guests earlier said, that each, each TED talk has a theme, and this theme was passion. And everybody was saying, oh, passion, Larry, you should apply to this. So I applied, and um, then then I got accepted. Now, funny question. Uh, did you have nerves after all of that, or were you in the zone, or neither, or both? No. it's. I mean, Well, first of all, I love public speaking. So to me, it, it's I'm one of those few strange people who actually likes getting up there on the mm-hmm. stage and is not afraid of it. Um, but you still have the butterflies, and you still want to do it right. And this is your chance to, to make an impact. And... Um, and, and I, you know, I guess it made a good impact because after I did this one, then I got invited for the next one. So they just want to hear more, uh, stories of the sea. (laughs) (laughs) That doesn't hurt talk universe. If you've done, if you are an astronaut or if you are a mountain climber, if you've done something interesting, it it does give you a little bit of an edge, which is a, 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 a good thing. The challenge is to make it not about me. Yeah. The challenge is to make it because the story, it might be my story, but to an audience, it's not about you. It's about how does it affect them Mm -hmm. and what can they take away from it? Good point. So how did you make those uh, changes in focus? Yeah. Well, after every time I write a speech, I go back and I I look at the you me uh, (laughs) ratio and I just, and I see how many times do I mention me and how many times do I mention you and you being the audience and how it affects you, and what you can take away from it. Larry, are you a memorizer, an improviser, or a blender? Uh, I would say I'm a memorizer, and there's a reason for it. Um, and I'm not a good memorizer, which is, makes it a challenge for me. Mm-hmm. But uh, when I when I write a speech, because I'm a writer as well, but when I write a speech, I feel that I'm really focusing on the exact word that I want and when you're speaking, especially in a short framework like a TED Talk, you only have a limited amount of time. Every word needs to count. There's no time for, uh, and I'm thinking about what I'm going to say here and that. So I try to memorize almost word for word what I'm going to say, and then I might improvise just a little bit on stage. Uh, here's the um, one of my favorite questions. What's the most unexpected, strange, or just plain weird thing that happened during or before your talk? <laughs> yeah, um, the, the TEDx talk, Golden Gate, uh, was very, um, very strict, very, you know, real. It was the real deal, you know, real professional. It had cameras everywhere. It was the first TEDx talk ever shot in 3D. 3D. Um, and, yeah. And so on YouTube, it's in, <laughs> there's one in, in 2D and 3D. Do they have like little waves during your talk or what? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's just, you, I mean, come they out, special... you walk out into, uh, into our uh, <laughs> personal space or <laughs> I'm trying to figure that out. I guess yeah, I need the glasses. Just, um, <laughs> uh, the 2D is fine is what I have to say about that. <laughs> you know, the enemy of good is perfect, right? It's trying to achieve. Or, or the enemy of good is 3D or 4D or yeah, 5D. Exactly. <laughs> but I would say the, the, the most surprising thing was, um, you know, I, you, I made myself practice my talk 100 times. I could give it forward, backward, in the bathtub, standing upside down. It, it didn't matter. But there you are on stage And you know exactly how much time it takes you because you've done it so many times. But there's a person sitting in the front row holding an iPad. And on the iPad is the clock, the Mm -hmm. countdown clock. And they're holding it like just in front of their chest. 
And then you get to 15 minutes and they hold it up for it's a little bit higher at their face. And then it gets to 17 minutes and they raise it up over their head. And at 18 minutes, they're they're waving it at you. They're going bing, 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 right? Because you've got a, about a minute and a half left to, yeah. to wrap it up. And that kind of uh, – that took me a little bit by surprise. All right. So Talk Universe, if you are organizing any kind of an event and are not afraid to delegate a very uncomfortable task in the name of efficiency, which is really the, the only standard that we're measured by when we're doing events, are we ending and starting on time or are people dragging out? That might not be a bad thing to emulate or delegate. Uh, Larry, any thoughts on that? No, I think it's a good idea. I think for <laughs> for those who weren't as prepared as I was, um, that was good. And the second tech talk I did, which was um, uh, the uh, passion, priorities, and perseverance, that one was a little looser. And one guy ran to 25 minutes mm. and nobody said anything. And mm. I thought, okay, that's really weird and bad. And it was not looked upon favorably by the audience either. And it may not make it onto YouTube per yeah, Ted's own uh, guidelines. I mean, I believe yeah. there's an 18 minute cutoff right there. But anyhow, Talk Universe, yeah. we've been enjoying this conversation with Larry Jacobson. His talk is called Passion Trumps Fear, and he has other talks out there. Uh, we've been enjoying talking with him about his uh, trips overseas around the world everywhere else. If you want to check out the actual talk that Larry did, you can go and type that into YouTube or you can go to be the talk.com on our show notes page. We will have the link, the live link. You can uh, click to passion Trump's fear. We will have another link that you can connect with Larry at Larry Jacobson.com Larry Jacobson with an O uh, S O N.com. And in a moment, we'll be back with the final word of advice for Talk Universe. Everyone wants to change the world, but not everyone knows the first step. Before you can change the world with your talk, it has to be selected. So grab the templates, timelines, and tools that I use to get my talk selected at bethetalk.com. And we're back with Larry Jacobson. It is time for the final word of advice for Talk Universe. For any speaker, any subject, any format, be credible. Be credible. Be who you are, uh, if you, if you're giving a talk about something that you just heard about, I'm not going to listen, be credible. I mean, I can speak about fear because I lived it. I can speak about how I managed my fears and how I got through them in my, in my Ted talk because I did it. So I speak from experience or someone speaks from extreme knowledge or wisdom, be credible. So the audience is, uh, uh has a reason to believe you. Larry Jacobson, thank you so much for coming on the talk today, sharing your adventures and your wisdom with us. It's my pleasure. I thank you, Nathan. Thanks for listening to Be The Talk. For tips and resources to help you change the world, go to bethetalk.com. See you tomorrow.